Welcome to EAU podcast series, Exploring Urology, a Roadmap for Medical Students. In this fourth episode, Urological Research and Clinical Trials, we are joined by Professor James Endow and Associate Professor Pavel Reva. The speakers discuss the critical role of urological research and clinical trials in advancing patient care. They share insights into how research shapes treatments and advice on how students can get involved in this aspect of urology. Whether you're considering urology as a career or are simply curious, join us as we uncover why urology is an essential part of modern healthcare and an exciting career path. Welcome everyone, my name is Paweł Rajwa, I am a urologist from Poland at the Center of Postgraduate Medical Education in Warsaw and currently also Honorary Fellow at the University College London. It is a great honor for me today to talk to Professor James Endow about urological research and clinical trials. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Paul. I am a urological surgeon, professor of urological surgery in Aberdeen in Scotland, and I am adjunct secretary general and the executive of the EAU responsible for the education portfolio of the EAU. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you very much, Professor. It's really a great honor for me. I would like to start with the first question about your journey into urology and how you became involved in research. Were there any particular mentors or experiences that guided you towards this path? Um, yeah, so I studied medicine in Aberdeen as a medical student, and I was really blessed to enter into basic surgical training scheme. In those days when I qualified, I qualified in Aberdeen as, from medical school in 1990. We had to do about four years of general surgical rotation. And actually, my first rotation, or, or at least my first attachment, in was in urology. And I must say that I didn't know much about urology before I entered it. And I was a baby surgeon, baby doctor, actually, in training. And that was one of my biggest mentors that set me on the path to urology was Uh, Dr. John Stain, Mr. John Stain, who really was a fantastic uh, all-round urologist or urological surgeon. In those days, the subspecialization did not exist, and and he was just a fantastic surgeon. But, you know, Paul, he was actually a good human being, very kind, had great love for the young doctors. And I think that that really made me fall in love with urology because I fell in love with the whole ecosystem of training, of mentoring. And I had my first publication, a case report, as a young young doctor. So I, I had a very good experience in, in Aberdeen. And then he helped me get a job in Newcastle. When I finished my surgical training after four years in Aberdeen, I went down to Newcastle and I had another couple of amazing mentors there, David Neal and Rob Picard. Rob Picard has passed. And in those days, Newcastle was the biggest training center in the UK and was outstanding. And they trained you not only to be a good urologist, all-round urologist surgeon, but they also trained you to be a researcher. Everybody had to do research in Newcastle. And I think that that really set me on my pace in terms of being a urologist, but also being a urologist that was comfortable as a surgeon, but also comfortable in clinical research and basic science research. And then I came back up to Aberdeen as a, as a consultant, um, independent urologist. And there I met Powell, three amazing people. One was the, the urologist that was the senior urologist now in Aberdeen, Professor Sam McClinton, now retired. He was the senior resident when I was a baby doctor in urology many years before that. And he was an amazing surgeon, but a good human being, really, really amazingly kind human being. But then on the research side, I met two health services researchers, Adrian Grant, professor who's passed away, and Professor Marion Campbell, amazing health services researchers, great in clinical randomized trials, great in evidence synthesis, systematic reviews, meta-analysis. I was introduced to Cochrane when I came back up here by Adrian Grant. So these were my initial roots into urology, not only as a surgeon, but also as a well-trained researcher. Thank you very much for your background and experiences. I believe it's really amazing, especially for us, for young uh, urologists and also students. But Paul, may I ask you before you go further? What was your, what what got you into urology? Because you're now a very well-respected young academic urological surgeon. 
So I'm interested because you you come from you know a slightly different part of the world from 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 me. So tell tell us about your journey then. Thank you very much. For me, it was it was quite similar at the beginning. So I would say I met mentor at the beginning of my career. His name is Professor Paradis. He's he's currently retired, and also a great team at the urology department. Because at the beginning, I didn't know what to do. I tried a little bit surgery, cardiology, different different specialties. And when I joined the department as a student, as a third year student. They were all super friendly or they were all supportive, helping me during the pathway. However, I would say as the department is great, there are several challenges, I think, in Central and Eastern Europe that, that make doing research in this region is a little bit more, I would say, tricky and, and challenging. First of all, I believe that uh, in Eastern Europe, the problem is that we don't really, at the beginning, we, we don't believe that our research can change practice. This is a big issue that we do research. However, we, we very rarely publish in good journals as, like Name or European Neurology as first or second or, or last authors. And most of our research is validating our people findings on our own material. However, I think it improves. The other thing in our region that I believe may be an issue is environment, which in my case was great. However, you have like more persistent in this region. Other people don't do fellowships. They don't do abroad. And it's, they're doing research, especially on higher level. It's very difficult. So I remember when I went to, to Vienna for the first time and had some phone calls for a senior consultant. After one or two months, you saw research, you saw surgeries? Yes, okay, go back. <laughs> and at the same time, Professor Shariat was really advising me, stay at least uh, one year, progress, learn. So this was really helpful. Another issue I think that we have here is, is that a little bit less connections. I think this is mostly to our history. Because as you know, we have socialism and communism and a little slight different history. We have chairman who is 65, despite you know being super supportive. His connections with other Western countries from Western Europe and USA, they are not so strong. It can be more tricky to go abroad. When I finally, after three years of trying, got to Vienna, I really work hard all days because this is something I really dreamed of. And finally, if I could advise something to young researchers and students from, from my region, is to go abroad for one, two years. Not that I don't believe in research in my region, because I strongly believe in it, but it's like with everything, with skiing, tennis, or, or playing football. When you have a strong instructor, your learning curve is much shorter. You, you progress faster, and you don't only, I would say, use experiences of your mentor at this time in you know, Western countries, but actually you use also experiences of his mentor, years of doing research. And then when you learn it, you can go back and really help people. So in your view, I mean, I, I hear you completely and I, I have seen and felt a lot of what you say in my travels. So in your view, the headline is you can do great work in your own country in neurology training, but really there's huge benefit in traveling outside of your own country to see how urology and research is done somewhere else, to learn and exchange ideas, take what you've learned in your own country to another department, another country, and bring back new things that you've learned there back home. Yes, exactly. And I think that's an important message. This is really important, I think, because previous generations from, from my region, they couldn't do it. So now I really advise young people, go one, two years, spend abroad and come back. See how it works in different parts of the world. And there are scholarships that you can get even from the EAU, of course, to help you achieve those ambitions of traveling to spend time in other centers. So collaboration is, is you know, and networking are important elements to how you progress in urology and in research, isn't it? Yes, yes, I fully agree. And I would like to ask you the second question. Uh, what are uh, some of the biggest challenges you have faced in running your studies? Well, I suppose it depends which type of studies. If you look at, say, traditional randomized trials, and we we do quite a lot of those from Aberdeen here at university, we have a very strong trials unit, and uh, maybe about 30% of the portfolio of the trials unit is urology trials. We do a lot of multi-center trials, nationally funded, UK government funded. And one of the biggest challenges for delivering good trials is actually the ability to recruit right? Recruitment is the key. If you cannot recruit, you cannot deliver your trials. And not only do you need to recruit, you need also retention. You need to retain participants so that your outcomes are collected. And I think recruitment, of course, the critical thing is firstly, the trial need to address an important clinical question. That's the first thing. It needs to address a gap in the evidence that your colleagues in other centers recognize as an important question and then you need to have 
the right set up the right infrastructure and the right relationships with your colleagues to encourage them because you need a lot of goodwill for people to help you recruit. And I think if you can address the challenges of recruitment, which is multi multifaceted, as I just said, then I think recruitment with files is fairly straightforward. I think generally, Paul, if, if the study is important enough, it is always possible to deliver it with quality. I think that is that is the headline that Firstly, a lot of work needs to go into making sure the question that you're being addressed is an important question and your own peers, wherever they are across your country or internationally, also believe that that this is important, then generally you should be able to address them. I'm much less experienced than you, but I fully agree. And this is something that is definitely you know, true. Another question, what are the current areas and directions of research in neurology and how have they evolved over the years? What do you see as the future trends in neurological research? Well, I think let's start with traditional research. Traditional high quality research, generally, even in surgical specialties like ours, is centered around randomized clinical trials, right? Because this is the highest level uh, in terms of being able to de demonstrate efficacy Uh, of an intervention and hopefully in time, you know, effectiveness of an intervention. So RCTs and observational studies, albeit prospective or even retrospective, are still research methods that are valid today, but they have limitations, right? They have limitations of generalizability of the data. You need to be able to not only have confidence that the trial you're doing can be generalizable to the real world, That generally is a major limitation, even for randomized trials that are of high quality, because generally you would find that you don't find certain populations in randomized trials, right? You don't find the elderly, you don't find people who are obese, people in multiple drug therapies, people from ethnic minorities, people from low-income countries, or even from Eastern Europe, for example, right? A lot of the trials are from white males or candidates from Northern, Western Europe or America. So I think that's certainly traditionally a challenge in research that we see. I think over the past 10 years, we have seen the growth of real world evidence, big data, research in big data. Why? Because it fixes these gaps that we we're just talking about, that you will look at populations beyond just a small selected population that fits into a randomized trial. So for big data or real world data, in effect, what you are is an unbiased, objective watcher of what happens in the real world. I think, Paul, the emergence of and the rapid growth of digitalization of healthcare and artificial intelligence, it presents a huge opportunity for higher quality research, but there are also threats. There are some threats that must be mitigated. For example, in the models that are built for AI or machine learning, It is important that the data that goes into building those models are not biased, right? That they actually reflect the real world. Because if you don't do that, then the risk you run is that AI models then will multiply the biases that already exist in the data that they use. And I think that's that's an important. I, I think the other area to just finish off is RCTs, trials, yes, clinical trials, yes. Big data, yes, but finally, we must be able to invest more in implementation science. How do you know and implement what we know already works, right? If you know something already works, how do we make sure it is well implemented in the real world? A lot of high quality data already exists that are poorly implemented. And a lot of data has shown that some interventions either do not work or are potentially harmful but they are still in use. Actually, what implementation science does is ensuring that what we know works, we then implement it effectively and demonstrate knowledge transfer to make sure it is being used and when we monitor outcomes. And when something is harmful, we make sure we take it off the market. So, but how to ensure that research findings, you know, translate effectively into clinical practice? How, how to make sure to... Well, there are, there are traditional scientific ways or knowledge transfer interventions, we call it, that are already well known of how do you actually bring something into practice? Because you need to understand what are the barriers. What is something we know that is good and effective 
what is stopping it being used by urologists? There are usually multiple reasons, right? From academic biases to treatments not being available or not being paid for by the government or by insurers or just not available in a particular hospital. So there are many different reasons why effective treatments are not being used. These are things that firstly, you must understand what they are. And then you put in interventions that mitigate or facilitate it being used more effectively. And there are traditional research methods in implementation science that helps us to do that. But I think also it's about honesty. It's about honesty in being able to collect outcomes to show that, okay, this treatment is not working. And if it isn't, let's communicate it widely and let's stop using it, right? Let's stop paying for it and let's stop using it. But it's not easy. It's not easy because once surgeons start using a treatment that they love and they know how to use, then stopping them is hard sometimes. The advancement in technology, and how do you see them influencing clinical practice mostly? Of course, research, but at the end, clinical practice, how can be used and it will be used in the, in the future? And it's also important, I think, there to mention the international collaboration for platforms and initiatives. Like- I mean, we've learned a lot, Paul, as you know. You've been along the journey with us in Pioneer and now in Optima. Pioneer uh, was the first real-world evidence, big data project that the EAU Guidelines Office led a collaboration, big collaboration of about 37 partners from about nine countries across Europe to look at outcomes of prostate cancer can be improved using knowledge from the real world. And I think we learned a lot. We learned a lot about the difficulties of sharing data. We did manage to get a lot of data shared from different departments in different countries, which was a huge plus. But it took a lot of time because it needed trust. That's first. The other thing we we learned was that we needed to harmonize the data to a common data model. We use OMOP. And to harmonize a common data model is desperately important because a variable in a particular disease like prostate cancer in Poland should be able to mean the same for the same variable from Scotland in Aberdeen when we come to a research collaboration. So harmonizing the data was the next step that we had to get right, and we did that. But the one important thing we learned, which comes back to platform of the Your Evidence Hub, is that there were clearly things missing in the retrospective environment, right? The in retrospective data. Robust disease stratification, if you use prostate cancer as an example, there are some data sets that didn't have PSA recorded prospective, that didn't have um, Gleason scores or TNM uh, uh, staging. Uh, and things like that needed to be rectified. Also, we, we found missing PROMs, patient reported outcome measures, PREMS, patient experiences of care measures, quality of life uh, data to be missing prospectively. So the Euro Evidence Hub was set up as a continuation of Pioneer to fix this, right? To start a prospective registry using prostate cancer as the first example where we collected data on the disease at diagnosis, collected treatments that the patient receives, and by informed consent also collected patient reported outcome measures and experiences of care measures and quality of life directly from the patient. This will be a huge step forward in terms of fixing a gap in data. But as you say, to influence practice, we realize that we need to also take this to the clinician and to patients in a clinic. And that means that we need to link the platform to computer interpretable guidelines and to clinical decision support tools that are available to you on your tablet, in your computer, in your clinic, and interfacing with your electronic health records for that patient. To do that, we need huge global collaboration. We already have ethics approvals in Spain, um, in Netherlands, the same is is happening in Greece, in Aberdeen, and in other places. And we hope to be able to do so in Africa, in Asia, and in Latin America. Because can you imagine, Powell, in a few years' time, if we have data, from across five continents, prospectively collected, and including directly from patients, their problems and their quality of life. Imagine the power of that knowledge it will give us in terms of what is happening in the real world. This will be formidable. I am already very thankful for being able to, to participate in this initiatives and process, starting from Pioneer, which, which actually have huge data and, and which are finally analyzed. And I would say uh, study leads of some of the projects. It will allow me now to start to make some discoveries that I hope will influence clinical practice. You already are, Powell. You already are. 
I am super, I am really excited that I am in Pioneer because finally now we have really like very strong data that will definitely support clinical decision making very soon on the way. And, and, and thank you very much for being able to participate in, in these projects. At the end, what advice would you give medical students or young urology residents who want to get into urological research? And what are the key skills to, to success? Well, I mean, that's a very important question, Powell. And, and I must say, I am biased because I love urology. <laughs> urology is, is easily this the best specialty in the world because you have not only amazing technology like robotics and amazing diagnostic technology, but you also have the opportunity to be a doctor who prefers maybe not to be doing major surgeries, but to, to give medical treatments. There's a huge array of medical treatments for the different diseases for urologists. So that's, so the first thing is the specialty is amazing. It, it has an amazing uh, family feel globally, whereas, you know, we're a very close-knit community. And I think for medical students or even young urologists, the key ingredient for me is one, curiosity. Yes, I agree. Right. If, you, if, if you're curious... If you have curiosity um, and then you link to curiosity, commitment to discovery of new knowledge, you add to that being someone who likes to collaborate with other people from across the world. You bring hard work to the table um, and you deliver what you promise on time and with quality. You can touch the skies. You, you can touch the stars, Paolo. You're, you're a great example, by the way, of why somebody should come into your uro urology. No, 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 I, I am, I am, I am, no, I am just young. You're a, you're a great, well, you're young, but, but you're a great example for the young ones that, you know, if they look at you, look at what you're achieving. Thank you very much for this kind of word, but I strongly believe that it's much more. I am at the beginning of my career pathway and there are a lot of things that I want to, maybe I don't, I, achieve is a wrong word, but to discover and to change. Correct. Thank you for, for all your support and for your interview, which I think is very insightful and especially for young students and researchers in urology. Well, it's been an honor talking to you, Paul, and an honor to work with you. Keep it up. Thank you very much. It's also an honor for me. Thank you for this insightful episode. We are sure our listeners enjoyed it. To keep up with the latest EAU podcasts and stay informed on urological advancements, be sure to subscribe to our EAU podcast channel on your favorite podcast app. Until next time, keep learning and stay inspired.